Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, at a fairly early age in uh, my walk with the Lord, I got connected with Kenneth E. Hagin. And uh, that opened up the door to uh, the, the, probably the two people that have had the most effect in grooming me spiritually. Now, now, I never met either one of these guys, OK? I was in meetings with them maybe once or twice in my whole life, OK? But never had a personal hand, never, never shook their hand, or hugged them, or anything like that. They never was able, never, never got close enough to them for that, OK? But they were a great influence in me, OK? And there have been other people like John Paul Jackson, A.L. Gill. It's been very influential with me through relationship, through strong relationships, OK? But uh, I found love with uh, Kenneth E. Hagin's teachings. Um, well, I wasn't very old in the Lord. And uh, what was happening was, I was in the Assemblies of God at the time. Let's just share just a quick testimony. I was in the Assemblies of God. And uh, I was doing some side work for them, like painting and cleaning stuff up that hadn't been cleaned up for, for a long, long time. And Anna and I were teaching Sunday school and doing youth ministry and stuff. Uh, but anyway, I found a library that had been hidden, a library of books that had been hidden underneath the baptistry. I don't think they wanted anybody to know they were there. And uh, I found a whole bunch of Kenneth Hagen books. OK? And uh, so I started reading them. Didn't have to pay for them. Started reading them. It was a good thing. I started reading them. And uh, I started reading them to the, the uh, you know, back in those days, uh, they were not writing books for money. They were writing books to get the information out. Do you remember the little bitty 32-page little books? You know, they were 50 cents to buy them. Now they're probably three bucks, OK? Uh, and there was a whole bunch of them in there, OK? So I started teaching them to the youth in our youth meetings, OK? Unbeknownst to anybody else in the church, all of a sudden, the youth became alive with the spirit, OK? And a revival broke out in the church because of the kids. The youth, the, the teenagers, OK? Because we had the youth meeting at 5 o'clock on Sunday night, OK? It was a two-hour youth meeting. We, we, we went outside and played volleyball and kickball and stuff like that for an hour. Then we came in and had a 45-minute had a lesson. And uh, I was teaching stuff like, you can have what you say. Uh, how to write your own ticket with God. OK, just, I, was, I was reading them the books. I wasn't even teaching yet. I was just reading them the books. And they started grasping a hold of it, OK? And they were, the 7 o'clock service was the Sunday night service. It was right after youth. And they'd come upstairs, and they were fired up. I mean, they'd get down front and start dancing. And, and, uh, and they, were, they were really grasping this stuff, that their words mattered. OK? Changed their whole prayer life. Changed their whole perspective. It changed their whole uh, relationship with God. OK? Well, then the pastor started getting phone calls. You know, because it, it overflowed at home, too. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the kids were turning out to be more spiritual than mom and dad, and mom and dad didn't like it. So they would call the pastor and say, would you, would, you, would you stop this young idiot from preaching this kind of stuff? They're destroying our kids. 
No, they're destroying your religious idea. That's all it was. They didn't want to turn loose of their religion and their tradition. They, they liked being dead. <laughs> OK? So anyway, uh, they tried to stop it. And, and the pastor called me in the office, and he said, uh, where, did, what, where, where are you getting this stuff you're teaching? I said, oh, it's right out of your library, in the, down there in the, uh, underneath the baptistry. I pulled all those old books out that you hid. <laughs> my, my days were numbered with the assemblies of God from that point on. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that, but, but Kenneth Hagin was very instrumental in my life. And, and, and he said this. In the Pauline epistles, okay, which is, you know, you got Colossians. He said, here's a quick, neat trick. I always had trouble remembering those four small epistles right in the middle, right towards the middle of the New Testament, okay? And it was, I, I, somebody gave me a phrase. And they says, if you remember this phrase, you can remember the order of those books. And it's go eat popcorn. Ephesians, or Colossians, well, Galatians. Go is Galatians. Ephesians, eat. Popcorn, Philippians. And the corn, the C on the corn, is Colossians. So I, I could remember. I just, I just remember that short phrase. And it, it helped me get there faster. Okay? So in, in those, in First and Second Thessalonians, and in, in the Pauline epistles, he put God-inspired prayers. This is what Brother Hagin says, OK? He's probably still saying it up in heaven. He said, they, 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 they said Paul got these prayers right from the Holy Spirit. And they're, they're greatly anointed. And if we would pray those prayers. Okay, I'm going to read you one today. Is that okay? Okay, so in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. For this reason, grasping the greatness of this plan by which Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ, I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, God, the first and ultimate Father. May he grant to you, verse 16, may he grant to you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with the power through his spirit in your inner self. Well, that's good. Okay? This was Paul's prayer. May he, may he grant to you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized through power or with power through his spirit in your inner self. Dwelling in your innermost being and personally so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you that, and may you having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love be, be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, God's people, the width and length, height and depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing, endless love. Now, how, how powerful is that? I mean, so I have prayed these prayers for years. This is a, one of the prayers that I've prayed for years. I mean, there was a time where I would pray four or five times a day. I would put it on three by five cards because I couldn't remember it. 
And I'd carry those three by five cards. I'd pull them out every now and then. I would just pull it out and read the prayer, okay? Praying it over myself, praying it over my family, okay? And uh, because you know something? The one thing that's needed in the church doesn't make, make any time frame. It doesn't make any difference from, from the infancy in the book of Acts all the way up to now, okay? The revelation of the love of the Father. It's the foundation of everything, you know? Until we understand the beloved identity, that, that, that our identity is, is, is locked in to the belovedness of our Father. And without that, we struggle. Okay, so that's what Paul was addressing here. Let me let me see if I can. Uh, and may you, having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love, being fully capable of comprehending with all saints, God's people, the width, the length, the height, the depth of His love, fully experiencing the amazing, endless love. And that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. That you may be filled up through your inner being with all the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives completely filled and flooded with God himself. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Now, God knew we were going to struggle with this. So he put the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Now, no one in the Old Testament, from Adam all the way through, all the Old Testament patriarchs, they never had an inside relationship with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit can only come into people that have been born again. Okay? Even David had a different type of relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come upon them. Papa, priest, and king. The Holy Spirit would come upon them, but he never dwelt inside of them because they didn't have a new spirit. They still had the Adamic spirit. Okay? And uh, so because of the cross, then people could get born again. And then they can have a new experience. So, right. So, the Bible says that the love of God has been shed abroad our hearts by the by the Holy Spirit. That's that relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know. Uh, you know, we, we live in probably, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to wrap this up. But isn't that a good scripture? Now, we live in probably one of the blessed times in the history of humanity. Stop and think about it, okay? Uh, Under the Old Testament, they had five books of the Bible. We have 66. The writings of the prophets and even the historical writings of the Bible weren't written until years later. Some of them weren't written until almost the time of Christ. And man was, at that point in time, man was 4,000 years old. Okay? Now, listen to this, okay? Concerning us. 
we live. Now, I know back in the 50s, the television was introduced. OK? There's been a series of different things. We got our first TV, I think, somewhere around 52 or 53. It was that. Remember the round one? OK, black and white. And we had to slap it to get us kick started, you know? And, uh, and there was very few programs on it, OK? Prior to that, you had to gather around the radio, OK? Now, do you know, this is fact, this is absolute fact, the church has been so religious that every time, I, I, I heard Lester Summerall say this, and I've also heard Graham Cook say this, OK? Every time God would release a new invention that was supposed to be grasped by the church, the church would reject it. Oh, that's a, that television's of the devil. <coughs> that computer is of the devil. Can't have it in our house. Can't have the radio in the house because it's of the devil. All it did was lock the blessing of God out of our lives because God wanted to use it. God would, God would come up with the idea, he'd release it to the church, and then the church would poo-poo it and give it to the devil. And the devil excelled at it. The devil's people excelled at it and ruined it. Then the church has to fight through prayer and fasting to get it back, and we never really could, give, never could really recover it. But we're living in a day right now, okay, that... People have gotten wise. The children of some of the most profound teachers of the Bible, okay? F.F. F. Bosworth wrote a book called Christ the Healer. It is taught in university as a healing manual, okay? His son, okay, has read the whole book up on the Bible up on the internet, on YouTube, and you can listen to it for free. You take it to work with you and listen to it while you're working. Called Christ the Healer. Okay? I went out yesterday because I, I wanted to refresh something in my, in my memory, okay, about something from Kenneth Hagin, okay? And uh, so I wonder, what, I wonder what they've put up on the internet. Well, on, on YouTube, every single one of his books and his tapes, his audio recordings, are up on the Internet for free. We have all this stuff that's been given to us for free. Charles Capps. I love Charles Capps. I love Charles Capps' teachings. He's just a, just a farmer from Arkansas. Okay? Annette Capps, his daughter, put all of his books, all of his audio files up on YouTube. They're available to you. There is no lack, now here's this power. There is no lack of spiritual knowledge in the world today, but there's a lack of people chasing after it. And a lot of times it's just because people don't know. Okay? I got to looking. I, I, I had a manual one time that was, I bought, and it was John G. Lake's, all of John G. Lake's writings. Okay? My pastor at that point in time had one. And I said, you know, I think I need one of those. So I don't know, 100 bucks, something like that there. I put it in a, a three-ring binder. It was a three to four-inch, four-ring bind, three-ring binder of, of all of his notes. All of his notes. Do you know that all of his teachings are up on YouTube right now? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All of Smith Wigglesworth's books 
are most of them, I'm not gonna say inclusively all of them, but a large, large percentage of them are up as audiophiles. Why would God do that? Right, because there's a revival coming, there's an end time revival coming, and we need to have the knowledge of it. Amen. And a lot of those men and women of God, okay, Amy Simple McPherson, okay, is another one, okay. Um, um, can't think of some of their names, my mind went blank. Uh, anyway, but a, a lot of those older people, they were so far advanced in their relationship with God. They would carry such... Smith Wigglesworth carried such a presence of God that it was, there was only like two people that this happened to, Charles Finney and, uh, and, and, and Smith Wigglesworth. There was, they would be riding in a train, okay, and the train would go through the town, not even stop to let anybody off, let anybody on, but just the presence of the train going through because Smith Wigglesworth or Charles Finney were there and they carried such a presence of God with them that the whole town would break out in revival. And sometimes 10 miles around. Right. There was one time, I don't know if this was uh, Finney or if this was Smith Wigglesworth, but the train was going through and the train stopped, and it didn't stop, but it passed by a factory, okay? And as the train, the presence of God, because of the man of God on the train, the presence of God was so strong, it jumped over into the factory, and they had to shut down the production lines because people fell out in the spirit. And people fell to their knees and started crying out to God. Do we need something like that today? Is that the kind of revival that God wants? See, they experienced it, and we can learn from them about how to acquire it. And God has saw to it that all that material is available to us. Hallelujah. Uh huh. Yeah. It's all about the heart of man. That's right. You know, talking about that, I was in some meetings with Ruth World Word. Ruth Heflin. Ruth, Ruth Ward Heflin. Okay, I'll get it out. Okay, I was in some meetings with her, and we were over at her campground, and I got, I, had, I, I got to meet her, and I got to sit down and talk with her. And she said this. She said, whenever God would say, go to, go to Germany and have revival, this was right after and during the time where the, where the charismatic Catholics were having Holy Ghost prayer meetings. And a lot of Catholics were getting filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? She said, if I would go to the Pentecostals, they would run me out of town. If I would go to the Presbyterians, they would, they would just say, no, we're not interested, okay? So she said, what I did was I, I, I got a hotel room, I got, I got a train ticket or a plane ticket, and I went to a town where God told me to go to, okay? And when I got there, I got checked into my room, and she said, the first thing I did was I started inquiring, where is the Catholic charismatic prayer meeting? And she'd find out what church it's at, when it is, and she'd go there. And she said, through those people, because those people were hungry for God and they were seeking God. And revival came to, I don't know how many different cities and how many different countries, revival came to, to people because, of, because the charismatic Catholics embraced her ministry. 
That was God. Yes, and that was God. And uh, so, wow. Uh, he's still the same God. God wants to do that today. And God's going to do it. God's going to find a group of people that will go ahead and engage this thing. And engage this thing. It's starting to happen. Is starting to happen. Morio Mori Murillo is having some phenomenal meetings all over the United States. Okay? Damon Thompson is having phenomenal meetings all over the United States. Okay? Some of the meetings that, uh, uh, oh, I can't think of, he was the, he was the president of uh, Christ for the Nations. I can't think of his name right now, but he's, he's having meetings. Okay? And uh, uh, just unbelievable, okay? God is starting to move. But God, yes. And, uh, and, and, and God is not wanting to have just a, just one or two or three people. God's going to start. But God wants the whole church to be on fire. God wants the whole church to come on fire. Come on, let's pray for that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, the, the graves that are in the church right now, it's not just unsaved people, but God, you want to move through the graves that are in the in the church today and create gardens of refreshment for cities and nations and counties and, and, uh, and the world. And we give you praise. Do it, Father. Do it for it, Father. We submit ourselves to be a part of that group in Jesus' name. Amen? How many people want to be a part of that group? Amen. Amen. Go ahead. I only took 20 minutes to introduce this song. <laughs>
turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens Into armies, you turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better. Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you There's nothing Nothing is better than you Nothing is better than you You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can You're the only one who can
Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing, nothing is better than you
take this thing even to a, a, a deeper personal realm because the Bible says that God's going to have a church that's without spot or wrinkle. Amen? Come on. Without spot or wrinkle. The church that's going to go up is going to be a purified Holy Ghost born again Holy Ghost till church without spot or wrinkle or the Bible's a lie that's why the rapture hasn't happened yet but here's the revelation that I want you to think about I am the bride you are my husband everything that you are you are in me I am the bride Come on, we got to understand this You are my husband Everything you are You are in me Now let's stop for a minute because I want, I, want to, I want to just say something about that We're going to come back and sing that again so keep it going Don't lose the beat Okay All we can bring to the table is our emptiness. There is nothing in us that God should desire of us, but yet He desires our heart. That's all. All I can do is give Him my heart. I have done. I haven't. I haven't done anything that would impress Him, except giving Him an empty heart that He can fill. But if I give him my empty heart, and through intimacy I submit to him as a bride, then the seed of the husband. How does a woman get pregnant? The seed of the husband goes into her and fertilizes the egg. I'm not going to be real graphic with it, but I mean, that's it. That's, that's in a nutshell, real simple, that's how it works. Okay? Jesus is our husband, and he is the seed that's coming into us. And everything that he is, is in that seed. The power of a seed. The power of a seed. When you plant an apple seed, you're going to get an apple tree. You're not going to get an orange tree because there's a power in the seed to reproduce. And that's why God set this up, that we become the bride, okay, so that the seed of the husband, who all, everything that the husband is, the bride becomes by a submission to it. So I am the bride. I'm happy to be the bride. I'll put on a dress to be the bride. <laughs> okay. Because I know what that means to the Father. If I'm the bride. Do you know how David got to be king? When he killed Goliath. 
Okay? David said, I'll give a third of my kingdom to whoever kills Goliath. But then he upped the ante. He said, including the hand of my daughter. Now, God had already anointed David to be king, but there wasn't a pathway in the spirit realm for him to become king. But after God gave him the ability to kill Goliath, he gave him the anointing to kill Goliath, and he got the hand, was it Abigail? Wasn't that the wife's, the daughter's name? Saul's daughter, okay? And that marital covenant, she became David's bride, and he became her husband. <coughs> now the pathway to the throne was open for David to become king. He was already anointed, but that anointing wasn't going to do him any good because he had to have a legal pathway. So here's what Jesus did. Jesus went to the cross not to get us out of hell, but to get us to become the bride so that we could be, that, so that we would have a legal so, well, let me put it that way. Let me put it this way, different way. So that the husband would have a legal pathway to marry us. Huh? And who he is is who the church is becoming. The Bible says that as he, as he is, so are we in this world. Come on. I'm the bride. I'm the bride. He's the husbandman. Who he is, I'm becoming. Everything that he is, he is in me. Huh? Come on. Everything that he is, he is in me. I don't know how you can sing that, but can you sing that? Can you put that to words? I'm the bride. He's the husbandman. Everything that he is, he is in me. Boy, that's a, that's a today's revelation right now. Can you guys sing it? Some, somebody grab that and sing it. give up everything to have him. Is there anybody willing to join me this morning that I'm willing to give up everything? I'm willing to give up everything and be a bride to the husbandman that is everything. He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth and this is his. He has all the silver and the gold belong to him. All power, all wisdom, all love is in him. I'm willing to give it all up so that I can have him.
this for a minute. God said he'll have a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. When we submit to the husband, that's called intimacy. When we submit to the husband, what happens? Everything that he is. All of his glory becomes the glory in the church. It's through union. It's through union. It's through us being one with him in the marriage of the lamb, or the, or the lamb and the bride, the husband and the bride. Hallelujah. Everything that he is, all of his wisdom is available to us. All of his power is available to us. All of his riches is available to us. We're an heir of the Father and a joint heir with the Son. Why? Why am I a joint heir with the Son? Because I'm the bride and he's the husband. There is nothing that Anna and I don't share. We do not have a 50-50 relationship. A hundred percent of me belongs to her, and a hundred percent of her belongs to me. It's not 50-50, it's a hundred percent. In a marriage covenant, two halves don't make a whole. Two holes make a hole. I've actually shared that to people that are getting married. You're not bringing your half. You're not bringing your half. That's, you, you, you might as well just go get the divorce now because half. It, it's true. It's an all or nothing relationship. That's why God wants all of me so that he can give all of himself. And everything that Jesus is as my husband. I get the pleasure of sharing it. It's not that I own it, but he get, I get the pleasure of sharing it. Wow. 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 Isn't it something? To think this, think this. The Father created everything through the Word. And in John chapter 1, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and His name is Jesus. And the second person of the Trinity, the Word, became flesh and is now our husband. And we are his bride. Mm. He created everything. Everything was created by him. All of the universe, everything in the universe, was created by him. Now I'm going to tell you something. Whether you like this or not, whether you understand this or not, 
God didn't need to create anything for himself because he was totally sufficient. He's El Shaddai. I am the all-sufficient one within himself. But everything that he created that we see, Gary, he created it for you. And he said, I, I, I legally, when Adam sold out to the devil, okay, the earth became the devil's because man had dominion over it. Okay? Jesus went to the cross to break that tie so that the rightful owner could come back, and that's the church. That's the church. God wants to share everything in the universe with us. He doesn't need it for himself. He can just go, he can just take his words and create another universe if he, if he needs to. He doesn't need to because this one is complete within it, but he just needed someone to share it with. And that's called the church, the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. And yet we turn around I was listening to Damon Thompson this morning, and, and I said, and David said this, Damon Thompson said this, when it comes time to take up the offering, and he said, well, God, I'll give if you'll make me rich. That is a really stupid statement. I'm going to tell you something. If you knew how rich you were, you'd be, you'd be willing to give everything and anything you got. We have, we have a wrong mentality. Our mentality is we're still trying to strive for riches. Okay? Riches were given to us in Christ. But we don't understand godly riches. Godly riches is wisdom. Godly riches is, has nothing to do with money. But it has to do with power, wisdom, strength the ability of God within us. That's a riches. Isn't that good? Come on, once we realize that all of His riches has already been bestowed upon us, then we're willing to give everything. Amen? Isn't that right, Gary? I know you said amen before I could even ask you. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Isn't that good? That's when graves become gardens. Come on. A rich garden, a grave, an empty, an empty soul being touched by God and give an understanding about the relationship between them and the Father and everything that comes to us through the... Say, without Him, I am nothing. But with Him, I am everything. I can say it this way. Without Him, I can do nothing. But in Christ, I can do all things. Why? Because I got all things living on the inside of me. I got the one whose name is I am living on the inside of me. Wow. That's when a grave becomes a voluptuous, how you say that? Voluptuous garden. There's a, there's a term in the Hebrew for the Garden of Eden. And there's only one man, and I think he's not even alive anymore, that I heard him teach on it. And there's a word that he put, what is, the word is, is there a word called voluptuous? Meaning just ab, 
meaning just to add the word actually what I, what I understand I never looked it up in a dictionary but if somebody's got a dictionary look it up uh, but I think what the word means is completely over and above what man can think and know that's what it, that's what the garden was And that's what's available to us when we, when we grasp the message of union with Christ through husbandmen. We become that garden. I'm not looking for another garden. I'm looking at becoming the garden because of him, not because of me. There's nothing I can do to become that garden except just surrender to him. But as I surrender to him, he is the garden and I become the garden. Graves turned into gardens. What do y'all want to do now? <laughs> Why don't you just start saying thank you? I'm going to tell you something. This isn't something we deserve. This is something that God just loves us about. I don't even like the word to say we, we don't deserve it because we, don't, aren't, we haven't earned it. But God set his love upon us. Let me rephrase that. God set his love upon us way before the garden, way before Adam and Eve were created. Megan, God knew the day you were going to be born. And he set his love upon you before Adam and Eve were created. Same thing with every one of us. Denise, Jess. God's been in love with you for, for I could say, 6,000 years, and that's probably not even justifiable. It could be a million years that God has had his affection on you. On the eternity past, as far back as eternity goes in the past, he knew me and had his affection on me. Aren't you thankful for that? Is there anybody here thankful for that? Come on.
Let me read you a verse out of 1 Peter chapter 1. That'll explain this whole thing to you that I've been talking about in the last 30 minutes. Grace and peace. I'm out of the Amplified Bible. That special sense of spiritual well-being, that's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace, that special sense of spiritual well-being, be multiplied to you in the true and intimate knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For his divine power has bestowed upon us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who has called, who called us by his own glory and excellence. As I'm reading that, let me just stop and say this. I'm drawn to Lazarus in the tomb. When he came out, he came out completely whole. He died, he was sick, and he died, and he was broken. But when God called his name, and he came out of that tomb, when God called, when God called your name, and you came out of the tomb of life, and you entered into a new realm of life, it was called the Zoe life. <laughs> we left the life of destruction and got called into the Zoe life, the life of God. For by his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has bestowed on us every precious and magnificent promise of inexpressible value so that by them you may escape from the immortal freedom, the immoral freedom that is in the world because of disrupt, disruptible desire and become sharers of the divine nature. Did you know you're a sharer of the divine nature? That's part of your marital covenant with Jesus. Jesus is one with the Father, and the bride is one with Jesus. <laughs> that makes you one with the bride. That makes you one with the Father. Because what the what the bride what the, what the bride is the, the husband is what the husband is the bride is. They become one. Wow. That's the true riches. Amen? Is that the true riches? Mm -hmm. Praise God. Well, that's why the greatest expression that I can give towards him is to just say thank you. Everything was done for him. Everything was done by him, for me. <clears throat> Religion is trying to teach us that there's still more to be done.
nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing broken. And when he comes in, listen, when he comes into my life, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken, just entered into my atmosphere. Mm. Hallelujah. El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God, has chose to live in you. In all of his wisdom, in all of his glory, in everything that he is, he's chose to live in you. If that's something to meditate on, That's something to comprehend. Don't you think, Brother Don? You know, we've had, Brother Don, we've had many, con we've had many conditions, many, many, many conversations about how do we become a son of God. The easiest answer is surrender to the son. and let him work it out. It's just all about surrender, just surrendering to him and let him work it out. There's nothing I can say, there's nothing I can do that's going to impress him. He is beyond impressible. <laughs> there's no wisdom that I have that's going to impress him. But when I lay down my life, say, take and do something with me. I give you myself. Let you just do something with me. Fill me with your wisdom. Fill me with your knowledge. Fill me with your glory. Fill me with your strength. Lord, I want to be one with you as much as you want to be one with me. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He's what? A new creation. All things are passed away, and all things are new. That's right. Yeah. And there's only one new man. Huh? Yeah. And his name is Jesus. But when I come into union with him, I become just like him. Through that union, through that surrender. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What do we say 
to a God that has given us this of a deal. That's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for loving me. You know, Don, continue with that. The thing is, I got to quit trying to be somebody that I have not, I don't have the power to become. And start being a surrender to the one that has all power. How many people say, I surrender? You know? Living a surrendered life. You know? How many people, <clears throat> how many people here are married? Most, most of the adults here are married. Let me ask you a question. I'll ask Vicki first. Have you, have, have, why, why me? Have you had to give up some things? It's, it is, right? Kim, we all have. Even as, I've had to give up some things. There were some things that I was eyeballing that I could no longer eyeball them after I was married. Now, now I'm not talking about other women. <laughs> so, so just get that out of your head. Right? <laughs> I'm talking about aspirations, things that, okay. But I'm so happy I found Anna. She was a tremendous treasure to me. What the heck she ever saw in me, I don't know. All I was, was a drunken, I wasn't even saved back then. I was just a drunken sailor. And if she saw something in me that she said she wanted to have. Sounds like God. It sounds like God. But there's, there's give and take. But the greatest joy for any human being is to find the pleasure of the Father. Don't you agree with that? Aren't you glad you found the pleasure of the Father? Aren't you found the one that, that loves you? The one that's given you everything that pertains to life and godliness? Already blessed us? I'm just 72 years old. The New Testament is 2,000 years old. A little less than that, but maybe 60 years less than that, written after Christ. But he put that in the Bible before I was ever born, that he's already given me everything pertaining to life and godliness. I'm glad I found him. Actually, I'm glad he found me. I know that he had a full-time job keeping me alive before I got saved. And I was, I was not, I never have 
thought about committing suicide. That was never a question for me. But I was living right on the edge. Uh, many times, if he would have taken his hand off of me, and I, had, I didn't know him, if he'd taken his hand off me, I would have entered into eternity. Rolling cars over, accidents. Stepping out in front of a car one night. They were doing about 50 miles an hour, and they were 40 feet from me, and I stepped out in front of them, and how they ever stopped, I don't know, but I should have had I should have entered eternity that night without God. But the man jumped out of that car after he got it stopped and ran over there and said, I don't know how I got stopped, but he said, I saw an invisible sign, an invisible hand come and got between me and you, and the next thing I know, I was stopped. That was the, that was the hand of God keeping me alive till I could get saved because he wanted me for his eternal glory. Come on. Come on, we all got stories like that. Every one of us had brushes with the death angel prior to us getting saved. But God wouldn't let it happen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You saw something in me that I couldn't even see within myself. How many got that story? Every one of us. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then it just gets better after that. I got a friend of mine. He's in heaven now, so he's, he's still a friend, okay? But uh, I got to know him. He was uh, pastoring a Methodist church, and uh, I was with the Assemblies of God, and we struck up a friendship, and, and uh, I was pastoring. Uh, I was a youth pastor at the Assembly of God Church, and I got to meet him in one of our meetings, in the community meetings, and we just struck up a, a real conversation and um, just had a great time together, okay? And uh, he always had a, a desire. He said, I'd like to be a professor at a university. So he went to theological seminary, got his, got his degree. And uh, he became a professor at Oral Roberts University. That was one of the last assignments that he had before going home to be with the Lord. But he got his degree. He finished up his degree. He told me, he says, Wayne, he said, I don't deserve this degree because I'm having trouble absorbing the material. He said, would you pray for me? He says, Friday, I got to go take a test. And I can't, I, I, I can't remember the material. I mean, th this guy was in his 60s when he was studying for his doctorate degree to go be at the, to, to go teach at the university professor level okay and uh, so I prayed with him okay and God gave him a piece just a piece go take the test he said the night before the test the kids you'll like this not, don't pray for this because he didn't pray for this but God's your help when you're in school. Look at me. God's your help when you're in school. God's a, just an ever-living resource of help to you. Okay? That night, he went to sleep. He said, I better get a good night's rest so I can go take this test in the morning. And then that night, while he was sleeping, an angel of the Lord came to him in a dream, handed him a piece of paper, and he read that piece of paper, and it was every question that was on the test. 
the next morning. That, that, that got just, I mean, literally, that was impressed within him. And the next morning, he went out. And the night before, he, he asked me for prayer because he said, I can't, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. He went the next morning and aced the test because of the visitation of God. God's a full source of help to you. When you turn to Him and you become, and, and, and you enter into that relationship of union with Him, He becomes a full source of help to you. He'll even help you pass English and, and algebra, okay? So, remember that. You heard a story in church about a man that was trying to become a professor. Couldn't absorb the material, but God had a way to get that material in him. And he aced the test. You say, could that happen to me? Ah, uh, it probably could. It possibly could. All right. Come on down. <clears throat> well, you can't plan services like this. I had no idea what we were, I didn't even know what scripture I was going to open it with until I got here and I was going to say, opened up my Bible. Well, I did. I opened it up my iPad. And then a scripture stood out to me, and I was impressed to read that scripture. It's interesting, we could do one song for an hour and a half. <clears throat> But it's not been a song for an hour and a half. It's just been in the spirit. You know, I love having church this way. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay. What church is supposed to be is the extension of our relationship with God and on a personal level. When we live in intimacy with God, then we come together and everybody hooks up together. It enhances the intimacy. And that's what we strive for, is to live in intimacy with God. Live in that place of union with Him. Because without that, we're nothing. But with that, he is everything. I don't know how many different ways I can say that. But that's the truth. That's what it is. I can do nothing except being joined to him. And then I can do anything that he calls me to do. Aren't you glad for that? <clears throat>